Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's training industry webinar for strategies to deliver human experiences in virtual learning sponsored by CLASS. I'm Sarah Gallo. Happy you could all be with us today for our webinar. We'll be getting started in just a few moments, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping items with you all. Make sure to pop those comments into your chat window today. You can also type your questions in the Q&A window. We'll address all of your comments and questions either during the event or at the end of the session during the Q&A. We also hope you will be interactive with us on social media today. Make sure to follow that Twitter handle on your screen. We are Class Tech as well as the hashtag TI webinars to stay connected. You'll also notice that a brief survey has popped open in your browser after today's event. As always, we welcome your feedback on the topic, content, speaker, anything else you would like to share with us. Here at Training Industry, we are the most trusted source of information on the business of learning. If you haven't done so already, make sure to check out our website, trainingindustry.com for original articles, as well as our suite of research reports, training industry courses, and to listen to our award-winning podcast, The Business of Learning. You can find all of these resources now at trainingindustry.com. Lastly, as always, today's webinar is being recorded and archived on trainingindustry.com. You'll receive a follow-up email from us with that link to share with your team, as well as the slides from today. All right, with that, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Chris Olson of CLASS. Chris Olson is a corporate learning and development consultant at CLASS Technologies with over 20 years of experience in organizational effectiveness. Primarily operating in the finance industry, Chris has overseen L&D, performance, employee experience and engagement, and has led 10 national bank merger and acquisition change management initiatives by leveraging technology focused on experience and modern learning practices, he has delivered a skills, skills and talent when organizations needed it most. Before joining class, Chris supported one of the top HR research and consulting firms, Red Thread Research. With that, Chris, please take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for the warm introduction there. Um, happy to be here, and I've been seeing a lot of uh, others in the mentioning around chat, happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Um, I'm not wearing green as you can see, but point for virtual because you can't pinch me. So, um, so a score for that. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here. We'll get to the actual presentation and I will go ahead and hit slideshow and away we'll go. So, um, so yeah, we're gonna tackle today four strategies for um, delivering human experiences and virtual learning. And so any questions on the table? So let's go ahead and, and keep it interactive. So feel free to light up that chat and send in the questions in Q&A. And uh, Sarah will be, um, I'll rely on you to let me know as they come through for anything I should address. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead and dive right in. Uh, we don't need to talk about me. Sarah already gave me a, a long-winded introduction. So we're going to just jump right in. Um, so one of the things, oh, I do want to add one little housekeeping item. Uh, we'll make this presentation available to anyone that wants. Often I see a lot of people wanting to get screenshots and screen grabs of some of the data. Don't worry about that. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. We'll just follow up with the uh, with the actual presentation deck to, for you to have as a resource um, just as, as a free given. So so don't worry about, about trying to capture anything if you don't have to. So the first things I want to talk about here for you know getting into the uh, subject of virtual learning and, and how to be more human, you know, because we are all people. Uh, it's pretty obvious to say that we've been living in some unprecedented times here um, with ever-changing environments and the and the constant shifts in the workplace and, and how things get done. So it's just been wave after wave of different changes. I mean, it, take the great resignation, for example. It's a new wave that's coming about from this. Everyone's still trying to figure that out. It's still very buzzwordy. So I kind of like, you know, whatever you want to call it, great reshuffle, whatever. The whole point is, is though, I think everyone's looking for something and yearning for what we want to call connection. And so being able to tap into the other people, being able to be seen and heard. And so some of the top uh, areas in the list here that are really important factors 
for creating connection are going to be, um, for instance, your manager, connecting with them and being seen, uh, not only them, but also the company and having a sense of belonging and having true connection in a broader com community within your organization. So we've historically relied on physical spaces to create and generate that sense and feel of connection, you know, like hashtag water cooler, right? Uh, where we can talk about the shows they watched last night or, or, you know, the football game or whatever it is. And so right now there's just been like a big shift in how we create the, that sense of connection. So we've had to basically implement new technologies and apply new practices around that um, just as in response to what's been going on with the changes of the work environments. So it makes sense that what we are seeing and in, in having a fundamental want from the workers and the global workforce as everyone's being dispersed is to turn to tech to help us to get through the disruption um, that comes in, in waves again, but they really want an impressive reaction that we collectively undertook, which is keeping the lights on, muddling through, but we have a moment here to be more careful and thoughtful in approach uh, around this changing landscape. So the way we work won't completely revert to the way it's been. I think that's kind of a given at this point when you look at what everyone's kind of pointing to, but there's new innovations that have come onto the scene that can help us be more productive and get more done when we travel. For instance, it's kind of funny uh, with the image here that we have of this gentleman working you know, outside on a ledge, I'm on route right now and I'm connected with everyone right now in a WeWork uh, and and because uh, I'm mid-travel so I can pop into a place in a co-working space, hop on a webinar with y'all and, and, uh, and, and being able to do this like on the fly, on the go. So with this HR and L&D, um, they really focus on, if, you know, truly what we want to do is focus on solving for people problems. So we have this mantra at class where we believe that technology doesn't solve problems, but people do. So the whole point of that is to really say, really the technology is in servitude for people. It's not to meant to replace and to, and to really take over like the people aspect of things. And so the problems that we're solving for should not be driven by tech in general. It should be driven to solve for the problems that, that we're facing in our workforce that are more human connection issues in my opinion. So as HR and L&D here have this unique position and it's, it's just a real transformational moment for us to be able to create connection in this new world, regardless of the tech that we have available um, and, and the ways that we can yield it in being able to work with uh, value to, to bring a, a different perspective, different scope, abilities connect with the managers to each other. So there's just a lot of different ways that we can reimagine the way that we've uh, viewed connection and outside of just the physical spaces. So that's why we've built class. Um, we're not gonna be a class commercial. I'm just gonna say one of the reasons around it is that we wanted to tackle that in the learning sector. And so we've um, we basically have seen the need for wanting more true connection to be more collaborative, more interactivity, and all the heavy mundane things just to like administrative burdensome uh, aspects of that uh, to, to try to automate that so we can focus on the actual connection and the content for everyone to be able to grow together and, and skills and development. So that's why we're so interested in the space and tackling it is because we, we just see a, a huge need in the market to be able to address for that. So with the human experience being disrupted in the process, as we all know, um, the, the way that we look at this and what we solve for the problems, there's three stakeholders. The first and obvious, is the learner, the ability to co connect and collaborate with each other and uh, being able to work with the content in real time. And so the other is the instructors and facilitators that are, are conducting the, the sessions um, live and virtual, shifting to VILT. They, we often heard that they're, they want to have the ability to help guide the focus and, and know the engagement that's happening within the virtual space. Because now what they have been doing in person, they can't visually see everybody in the room. Um, now it's, it's, they can in, in Zoom, but maybe they turn the camera off and they don't really know. They can't read body language. They can't see the facial uh, responses as well. So there's um, ways that we want to solve for, for that problem as well. And then administrators. The, like they're the unsung heroes, the wizards behind the curtain that are keeping the, the organization running as a well-oiled machine for the learning side, whether it's tech or communications, the logistics and, 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 and planning of everything. We really want to help support them and uh, they have a significant role that has a ripple effect um, that, that applies to all the, the previous stakeholders. So we really deep, did a deep dive in, in, um, in addressing all those, but really at the end of the day, what what I find is most useful because everyone has created hodgepodges of tech and they've changed their uh, design and flow of their programs. 
really the ultimate thing that helps strive to improve that is, is tapping into like really what is inspiring and really what you wanna do that really provides meaning. And really the, the way I like to uh, phrase it simply more is you just have to give a damn. Whether it's the cause that you're trying to enable by upskilling and reskilling, or whether it's the other people on the other end of the screen that you're trying to grow and support. The key message that I think for us as human beings is to have that sense of purpose, be inspirational, and to really just give a damn about what we're doing. And I think through that, you're gonna find unique ways because we're gonna go through some of them that we've discovered today as best practices, but they're just like constantly coming. I'm sure there's gonna be others on this call here that will have new things that I haven't even uh, discovered yet. So I think that we're just gonna see more and more of that, but the root of it all, and the reason why we're all here in this um, space and the roles that we're in is to really care for the others on the other end that we're growing. So we're gonna tackle uh, and go through some of these uh, strategies here that we've kind of identified. And the first one is that we wanna call out about being intentional because what's going on right now in the market is that uh, this is a, a recent study from Harvard Business Review where they've identified that we're actually spending 359 billion. The article had 350, but when you read it, there's just an extra 9 billion that's being spent on training and development globally. This is as of 2019, and I'm sure this has increased significantly since then, but this was a key finding that they found back then. Yet the thing that they're, that we're finding is that only 12% of the learners are actually reporting that they can actually apply the skills that they've learned. So that means north of $300 billion is just not being applied to the actual true um, uh, training and development of the workforce. So oftentimes what happens is, is that we've, we focus more around you know, checking the box, uh, doing the fire hose approach, not thinking of the true experience. And so it's the, what everyone is, is seeing when they try to go through that, you really have to be more human centered design around that process in order to make sure that they're gonna be able to, you know, wanna be retained there. Because the number one thing that everyone agrees upon is that if you provide career pathing and opportunities and upskilling, they're gonna be more likely to stay. And I think one of the key things that helps create the culture and helps embody um, the ability to transfer the knowledge and, and ultimately culture is actual conversation. And I think that's the real key for when we say, you know, things around culture and, and communications and, and connection. It's really how are we talking to one another? And, and that's really the key. And the better you can focus on those, that's where you're going to get a lot of um, a lot of value. And there's a recent Gallup report, uh, for those that are familiar with Gallup, they've, they've uh, global re industry uh, uh, research statisticians here, uh, they do a lot of, of, of phenomenal analytics here in, re in response to the workforce. Um, they've found that with the new shift, that what they're seeing is it's not, it doesn't really matter with the connection between the employee and manager. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's in person or if it's digital, it just matters what you are saying and what they are hearing. And that is the true key for creating the connection. It really, they found that there was actually no difference between uh, the two. It just matters what's being discussed and, and what they're being heard and listened to. And on the, converse, or on the topic of conversations, one of the things that, that you, that's highly suggested by um, Elliot Massey, one of the uh, you know, thought leaders in the space as well, is that he, he said, he's discovered that he's found a key thing is to talk about 75% the normal speed you would in order to address some of the things for uh, things to resonate for what you're trying to um, impart onto others. And so this is one of the things where there's four bullet points to kind of help solve for some of those. You know, we don't need to go through all of them, but they're listed out here. The key messages is to allow them time to process, to hear, and to index it, and to think of a response so that they have an opportunity to, to give feedback and to deep dive more onto things where there might be uh, something they need clarity on. And also, it's helpful for those that might be distracted because if you're going super fast and you blink and you miss it because of, you know, maybe email pops up and distracts you, like slowing down and allowing some pace uh, for, for you know, the humans to, on the other end, to listen in and be able to hear, that's gonna be uh, super effective. And we didn't test this for audio, but I'd love to see real quick. I just played a little bit there. Sarah, I just wanna check in to make sure that the audio is coming through um, on your end for everyone else that's attending. So it's paused right now. Feel free to press play and then let's see. Guys, can you hear me? Yep, perfect. No, no, cool, cool. It's Terry. Yeah, real fast. Why don't I hop on and touch base and close the loop here? 
I have a hard stop at 12, so I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. So as a quick level set, and I want to put this on everyone's radar, and you may want to keep this in your back pocket, I'm going to piggyback off your first point. We're in a very unique position right now to launch this whole thing at scale. So I want to make sure we're striking while the iron is hot and gathering all that low hanging fruit and not burning the candle at both ends, even though bandwidth is low, because we want to get shit done and done is better than perfect. So we're going to need all hands on deck and boots on the ground. And those boots do need to be in lockstep because we're not saving lives here, but our lives do depend on it. So if anyone has any questions for me, that's about it. So uh, feel free to ping me, circle back with me, keep me in the loop. My door's always open. Oh, it looks like we all just got five minutes back. So maybe you've probably heard some of those things before, little muscle reflex and conversation. So the point of that is in all those words that he was putting out there, what did he actually say? And, and the whole point of that is like nothing. There was nothing substantive with that. And so that that's really how we're talking to each other all the time. And so we're just going through the motions and doing the, the muscle reflex of, of words uh, that aren't really like actually speaking to one another. And so that's kind of a, a, a first kind of foremost thing that, you know, I'm guilty of, a lot of us are guilty of. We take words to try to sound more intelligent or that we feel comfortable with or try to fit in. Um, even the word methodology. I, this is like a big pet peeve of mine. So I'm just going to call that buzzword out right now. The whole actual definition of the word methodology, uh, if you break down ology, it means the study of. And, and But we're saying, when we're saying this and using it in conversations, we're saying the study of the method and the def, is, is the definition of that word methodology. But really, when we're talking and using it in our conversations, it should just be the method. It's honestly a lot simpler and easier when you think about it. And it's a lot easier for others on the other end. It's just less for less letters in the word, just simpler and easier. But we're constantly trying to like, you know, hang on to those buzzwords and, and using them. And they're just really hard to get away from. I'm not, I know it's never going to go away, but I would love it if we just, you know, talk more plainly and simpler and, and thought of um, others instead of thinking of trying to worry about, you know, sounding like we are. We are uh, hey guys, can ahead. you hear? There we go. Instead of trying to listen to the other to the other person on the other end. And that's the real key thing that I find in conversations is actually the active listening aspect is what's going to make your conversations more effective. So Adam Grant, who's been making the rounds quite a bit uh, with his latest book of Think Again, I pulled this quote from there that I find pretty fascinating. And I just highlighted in, in blue the aspects of it that he says that the power of listening is a display of respect of expression of care. Uh, and it gives the most precious asset that we have, which is our attention. And so by giving that, you're going to find that they're going to be more open and willing to listen to what you're going to have to say by providing them the act of listening and giving them your attention. So that's going to be super key and, and make sure you have meaningful conversations. And again, this is something that's that isn't tech specific. It's, you know, there's a lot of things in here that are um, tech related and non tech related, but because we're dealing with people, we're just applying this in the um, in, in the virtual space, but they're really just things in general that you would do uh, anywhere. So, so now we're getting into a, a second strategy here, which is going to be understanding your audience. And uh, before we dive into that, though, I think I've been seeing quite a few chats and some Q&A. So I just want to check in with you, Sarah, to see if there's anything we should break for to address from the crowd. Absolutely. It looks like we are all caught up for now, Chris. Excellent. Great. Okay, so um, so for this part, understanding your audience. This is my friend Adam. He's he's great. He's one of my best friends, and he's a super intelligent person. But I love one of my favorite things is to publicly embarrass my friends. Um, so so be careful if you ever want to become my friend, is because I will I will look for an opportunity to exploit you. And so uh, I did get Adam's permission here to kind of share some of his foibles that he's had. Uh, but he's as I mentioned, he's incredibly intelligent. He works for General Motors, where he helps to uh, design interiors of vehicles to be more um, actually a human um, a human experience to be more kind of uh, 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 perfected for you know removing distractions and things like that. So. Uh, so I find it funny, though, because the <laughs> he's got some stories around his uh, misperceptions around how technology is used has kind of gotten him into trouble. For instance, uh, some might be familiar with the app Shazam, where you hold your, your phone up where, and pull up the app where it listens to music and it hears the audio signature of the song and it will like let you know what that song is. Well, he thought you sing into your phone and then and then it will tell you after that. Google's figured that out now, but the few years back when he did this, it, that wasn't how it worked. So 
in the car drive home at late at night, he heard a song he liked, sang into it, triggered Siri, and it called his ex-girlfriend of three years ago, and he was singing her uh, the chorus of a love song without knowing she was on the other end. So super awkward conversation. Now the point of me, like, you know, making fun of my friend other than just getting satisfaction out of it is that he didn't have the context and understanding of the technology that he was using. And so we have to think around that as we're providing new technology to our workforce, um, whether it's for learning in, in general or for just work in general, we need to let them know that they have the context as to what it's used for and, and when to use it, why to use it, how to use it. And so that's a key component in making sure that, that uh, we're gonna get the maximum benefit of the, the technology investments we make. Also, another uh, foible of his is that he committed one of those uh, uh, faux pas of having his web camera on when he didn't realize it. And so he had a meeting at work where uh, he didn't have a shirt on. So kind of an awkward thing when you're, when you're with your coworkers and, and you do that. Now, the missing context to this, if you would read through, if we saw the comments here, is that he was dealing with um, uh, 95 degree heat and uh, incredibly high humidity and his AC wasn't working at his home. And so his AC unit went out and so he's just trying to be as comfortable as he could. And so, so in the context, when you read through, you, you feel a little bit more sympathetic towards him. But the whole idea is that we need to understand the environments that our learners and our, and our um, workforce is dealing with in their space. Uh, I think of, of those that might have uh, live in a rural area where they have limited internet bandwidth to be able to access um, videos and the streaming capabilities that they would have. Uh, I think of um, single mothers who, you know, maybe daycare is closed on that day, yet they still need to get work done and they might have a child in the background and, and trying to support them through the distractions of trying to care for their family and get work done at the same time. So there's just things that we need to think about and, and get context around our audience and, and, and try to accommodate for the different things that they're experiencing. So I have a quick poll question that I'd like to throw out to kind of get into a little bit more human-centered design, product design thinking. So just a quick example for us to think about that. Um, I'd love to just quickly ask everyone, uh, um, what is going to be, uh, oh, we had one poll question. We're gonna just skip over to the next one here. And this is going to be um, uh, prompting you to say, who here owns this broom set? And so we'll give it um, just a few seconds here to give everyone a chance to vote on if this lovely broom set you, that we have here in front, who actually has this in their home? All right, everybody, take a few moments, pop your answer into that poll. Three, two, and one. Okay, we've got 14 that own this. Okay, with 86% that don't, and they haven't seen it. And so the point of this is, is to say like, Okay, that's not the, the biggest number. So there's a majority that don't have this. Now, I don't want to like um, uh, 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 judge those that do own this because it actually is probably a very stable and impressive broom set. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare it to something else that is out there that, that might be more helpful for the masses. And so the thing that this that is unique is that this um, broom dustpan set is that it costs around $150. And we think about the value and what you're getting for that. Uh, for for the the large scale say of your of of you know of consumers is that the and also the amount of reviews they've only got two reviews on the website in which you can purchase this from is that it's just probably not delivering the amount of value for everybody that that's attending so it's going to help for some that want that and 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 prefer that but as a whole there's a whole lot that that are not going to be investing in this and not and not going after it. So what we have now is this uh, set. And so this is a Swiffer, which is pretty commonly known, pretty popular. And I just love to throw out the next poll question here to see who owns this or has owned it at one point in their time. If we can go ahead and load that up here, we'll give everyone a few seconds here to go ahead and respond to this poll. All right, again, take a few more minutes, pop your answer into that poll. Three, two, and one. There we are. And look at that. That is like literally the the like exact opposite, where eighty six percent have owned this at one point in their time, and fourteen percent have not purchased it. So it's like literally the exact inverse of that. And the reason I call this out for why there's such a, a massive success for Swiffer is that um, is that the organization 
that purchased it or, or created it, which is has a price point of just under seventeen dollars, with almost forty six or just a little over forty five thousand uh, five star reviews on Amazon, is that the reason that that's so successful is the amount of research that they did in understanding and, and monitoring everyone to make it such a success, where they had um, made a hundred million dollars in sales in the first uh, in in the final four months of that year. Uh, that's just in four months, a hundred million dollars for a 17, for almost $17 item. It was the most successful successful product launch Procter & Gamble's ever had, but that's because there's a research company in Ohio that just like literally watched and monitored uh, the way uh, everyone was using brooms and mops within their homes to design something that's gonna help uh, solve for the problems that they're facing in, in the home place. So what can we do then to try to take some of those principles and, and, and lessons learned from that? So a couple of things, depending on what's available to you, because some have access to more things than others, uh, depending on, on you know, the resource in, in, in your organization that are available, is that the first thing you do is to think of how you can involve yourself into their daily workflow, whether it's monitoring them, job shadowing to understand, uh, maybe you meet with the managers to understand the, the, um, the capacity and workload that they're facing with, to find what time you can make available for them to be able to provide the training. Um, so it's just really understanding walking a mile in their shoes to really get a good lay of the land. Uh, secondly, is that you can seek feedback from them. And, you know, yes, you can do surveys and things like that. If you're lucky, lucky enough to have a people analytics team to provide you insights and data, so it's user behavior and not just, uh, not just a survey feedback, even better. But, but even if you just have some great targeted questions to really understand where you can improve. And by the way, you have to check your ego at the door for this. So if you do have training programs that you've rolled out and launched, um, it, you, the, I, I guarantee you there's always room for improvement. There is improvement for this webinar I'm presenting on, I'm sure. So you can feel free to send me any feedback for me to get better at this presentation. And I will take that and value that feedback because it's gonna make, make things better and make me better in the process. So there's really things that you're gonna have to open yourself up to be vulnerable, to get the improvement uh, that you're looking for in your programs. And then lastly, uh, what I find is you're gonna get more involvement and better, uh, better results when you're actually able to involve the actual users in, in the process of solving for the problems that you're facing. So if you can't figure it out on your own, then bring in those that are like on the, on the end user end of this to help solve those problems with you to, to, um, to find the creative solutions that you, you can have to make a better, a better uh, program that you're trying to roll out to your organization. Um, so just very simple uh, things and, and, and it's not cookie cutter, but just some very simple principles for you to kind of think about, think about and be able to take action on to improve the experience. Because oftentimes what we're doing is we're focusing on the content and we're, we're, and we're putting a lot of time and effort into to developing that. But then when we're delivering it and then the thinking of the, the options that we're able to uh, send them to with the technology, whether it's an LMS, whether it's your, uh, your, your virtual platform that you're using for your synchronous learning, uh, you got to think around like what is the experience that they're actually receiving after you've spent all this time and effort onto your training programs and courses that you're rolling out to them. So, and one of the other things I like to uh, have everyone think about is what's the priority here? Because we're dealing with humans. Is, is it that we're checking the box and getting something done and, and hitting that deadline? Or is it that we're actually providing them an opportunity to digest and think of the training? Because right now this is kind of often what we hear, how everyone feels around doing the training is like, it's, we just gotta get it done, check the box, let's move along before we get in trouble. But are we actually providing them say, eight hours of sleep so they can have neuroplasticity to remember what they just learned and have that built into their brain. Um, and so oftentimes we're just trying to get it done and say we did it, uh, and, and not we, but but I think the, the organization is kind of designed that way versus making sure that we have the operational design of the workplace to kind of be readjusted to make sure that humans are able to become effective in the best way possible. So the, the thing, the elements here, the human elements that I think are gonna be just phenomenally valuable in this process is having a sense of empathy and how you're designing your programs to just really be uh, sensitive to around what everyone is experiencing as a whole and being able to synthesize that to provide a better experience. And then, um, and then the, the, cause the end result that you're looking for here that I, that I, you know, this is a little bit of a personal opinion is to help them be curious and, and to be engaged and be inspired in what it is that you're trying to teach them. And it's hard to do that. Um, compliance 
uh, for instance, in your highly regulated industries. Not very sexy and fun. It's super hard to make that engaging. But I think if you're able to tie that to them and, and how it's going to help them support in their job and the reason why, if you're intentional around that, you're going to find much more success and completion rates and things around that. Um, some of the things where I love to get creative, this is a question I pose. Um, we can't do it today, but it's a question you can leverage and use just as an example, is that I like to leverage questions that are going to get people to think about things and be more inspired uh, to solve for problems together. So this is a question that I throw out there because it was inspired from uh, uh, a story where in a book where uh, there was a, a gentleman who was at 17 years old in the 1940s in the South trying to fight segregation. And his, um, his uh, uh, niece was doing a, uh, a book and research around like his life story and why he was fighting for that at such a young age. And, and um, his response to her for why he was fighting for civil rights uh, in, in fighting segregation in the 1940s was that he just asked himself, what is the greatest problem facing our generation? And what can I do about it? And so that's what that was his solution. And the thing I love to throw out with this question is, in a breakout room for for people to discuss, is what do you think that greatest problem is? And it's just so fun to see everyone think around what what the what that is and how they can help solve for that. But even just trying to define it, it's it's just it's just an interesting to see everyone share their perspectives around it. So. If you can come up with great questions, you can find that you can just set it out there for others to be able to um, commingle and, 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 and be inspired to be able to, to do that. So just a quick example here of, of a question that I like to leverage when, when you get the opportunity, because again, I think the key message here for, for tapping into our human aspects is that it, as, as I let's uh, take this quote from the author of uh, The Little Prince here, is that it's not really about the work. It's about the end result and where they want to go and what the vision and purpose is. And so, um, so that's just a key message that I, I love to try to throw out there whenever I can to help um, inspire everyone else. And more simply put, is to simply give a damn. Again, because it's not about the work and the mundane tasks, it's about the end result of what you're trying to achieve. So now we're going to get into how we can create opportunities for connection and some cultural aspects within your organizations to, to address that. Um, so just now we're on to this next section. I just want to check in, Sarah, is there, if there's anything we should follow up on before we proceed. Absolutely. We do have one question for you that came in from Casey, who wants to know, how do you address what to know what skills organizations should be focusing on? Yeah, so excellent question. We're actually going to tackle that in the in the last uh, section here for um, uh, for for number four. There, it's it's all it's all about skills, and so I'm I'm going to push the pause button on that. But that will be a definite highlighted item for for us to address. Um, so, any anything else before we before we proceed there? I think we are all set. Great. Okay, we'll look forward to addressing your question, Casey, in just a bit. Um, so here for providing opportunities, one of the things that I want to call out is um, this is uh, some data that came from Wilson Learning Worldwide, where they have found that if you are able to create the connection to the job and human support, it results in better outcome in performance and skills. Uh, so, so I think if you think around, this is actually one example to be a little bit of a segue into the last section, is going to be uh, connecting the skills to the actual job in which they're doing, and, and to be able to give them like the context in which they're doing, and that will provide you much better results. And so um, just connecting, again, connection to human support is going to be key. And so one of the things that helps to support a great effective culture in doing that is that um, is, is gonna be actually working virtually and remotely, which is kind of a surprising thing to hear. I think oftentimes when we've heard around even like hybrid or, or being remote and doing the shift, it was all like, how are you surviving hybrid? You know, and, and I think what's funny and ironic is like, there's really not much to, to survive. It's, it's, there's a lot of advantages that people are seeing, but it's just simply shifting. It's more of the change management is what we're dealing with. And so, it's the changes where we struggle and feel those pain points, because what we're seeing here, if you, you really comb through the data, according to Gartner that they just conducted, is that only 4% have said it's gotten a lot worse shifting to uh, the remote settings, and 20% have said it's gotten a little worse. But if you look at the other side for the positive, 44% say it's approved some, 32 said a lot. And so that's pretty pretty um, jarring statistics there, severe contrast. and. Often what I see in here as well on the topic of diversity and understanding your audience 
I feel like there's a lot of introvert extrovert impl implications in here because there's been a lot of introverts that are super happy in this because now they they feel like they can actually be more productive they can work in their comfort uh psychological safe space and then those that feed off of the energy of others i think that's where they took a big hit and so that's where the got a lot worse and gotten a little worse are coming from i just that's kind of what we're seeing i think in this and i think as we're thinking of diversity in our um, aspects we should think around not just the ways in which we're you know demographically diverse, whether it's um, ethnicity, gender, age, uh, location, all that, but also even in how we're as human beings. Because the satisfaction in, in that is pretty evident the more you deep dive into it for even things that are uh, human aspects to this. For instance, uh, we're getting 2.4 times more likely higher employee engagement in the, ver in the, in the remote environments. 2.7 times more likely have an effort and intent to stay. And if you add some career development opportunities and clear, uh, give some clear road paths and, and uh, to that, that's gonna like go through the roof. And then you got 3.5 times more likely for those that say inclusion has actually improved uh, in, their, in their culture. So that's pretty significant, 3.5 times more likely for, for um, inclusion to be reported in there. And the funny part in all this the the ones that have been most skeptical in this process and you still see a few that are trying to make their excuses for why you want to go back to the office you know ceos in, in very large buildings and headquarters trying to encourage everyone to go back uh that they usually get um sound bites in the news is that the majority of those suits we could call them you know the c-suite level those senior leaders they're actually almost two times more likely than individual contributors to admit like yeah things are actually better in the culture so this actually blends itself into learning as well too once we think in and shift around how we do that uh, to be able to provide some of that um, so one of the things i actually want to tackle on that topic is thinking around and this can also tie into the human center design the stuff we were doing in person that now just went on to virtual um, i think that there's a lot of thought you should think of around how you deploy the your the timing of your training um you know does it have to be you know full-on work days where you do two workday shops all at once like you did before in person because everyone was gathered in that physical space or can you drip it over time and you can make it so it's like actually paced at a a, a more human human aspect in in thinking around um developing the time to practice and then revisit what what they learned to help make sure that the knowledge is being retained and and then you know not making it so much an event but more of an, more of a journey. So just some things to think around as we as we kind of made made the shift and in, in the and in, into the virtual space. So last section here, we're going to talk around uh, making learning more relevant and applicable, and that's going to be the, the question around skills. And so um, we'll go ahead and dive in. But before I jump into that, Sarah, just last uh, check in for the last section here. If we got anything we should address or talk about. Yeah, absolutely. We have another question that came in from Tom, which was, what's your recommendation on hybrid? So that blend of in-person and virtual learners at the same time. Yeah, that's difficult. Um, it's uh, much like most things. And, and I'll even add another question that I typically get as well, too, is, um, is going to be around uh, very specific, like what time do we ask questions? What, what what time do we, you know, put people into breakout rooms? What what at what point do we? How long should our sessions be? And so, the problem is there's no right answer to that. And and I feel that's kind of the same for the hybrid space too. And we're still trying to figure out hybrid. Um, I do a lot of global uh, webinars and 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 uh, work with a lot of clients in, in a global scale too. And different countries are a little bit more ahead of us in hybrid, but even they're still adjusting and figuring out. So I think it's going to be a process that we're going to see over, you know, honestly for hybrid, I did a webinar talking about hybrid and, you know, back in that that uh, webinar, which was six months ago, the question was, yeah, or, or the thought process and projection was like, six months later, we'll have it figured out. Well, that webinar was six months ago, we haven't figured it out yet. I think the, the main thing in hybrid that you need to think about, though, is how am I providing an equitable experience between those that are in person and those that are joining virtually? If you think of your way to be able to balance that, the, the tech is not there yet, in my opinion. I think it's gonna get there, 
but because you're doing things digitally, if someone's gathered in person, they might miss out on content and things that you're sharing, or they can't have a way to chat and provide feedback as easily as those that might have their iPads in front of them to, to be messaging and sharing and interacting with the digital content that you're pushing if they're gathered, gathered in that physical space and they're in a room just watching it together. So, and then on the other side, you could have proximity bias if the host or facilitator has everyone there in the room with them. And so they're, you know, kind of giving the those in the space priority over those that are joining virtually. So then they feel left out and excluded. So the real thing to tackle and solve for is how do you provide equity for both of those experiences? And if you can't, maybe just make it all in person or maybe make it all um, virtual. And, and so if you can't, that, that's the, if there's a little bit of imbalance, just try to keep that marginal because that's the real key in all of this is, is just providing a, a fair, equitable um, uh, experience for, for both sides. And there's no right answer to that because we're, we're still all figuring out. But I'm excited for what tech is coming forward with. I think it'll be another year until tech is um, caught up to really put a dent into that. So right now we're still on our own devices to try to solve for that. All right, any, any other questions there, Sarah? I think we're all caught up. Awesome. Okay, so skills, what skills? Um, the, so the first and foremost thing is that I think we need to reevaluate the skills in which we're providing uh, to Casey's question. And so, cause oftentimes I think what we've seen in, in this shift is we've actually found, hey, maybe some skills aren't as relevant as we thought as before. And maybe there's new relevancy in some skill sets now that we're in this new um, kind of remote hybrid workplace as we're, we're start, cause we've gone remote. Now we're going back into a hybrid mode here. So I think it's just really adjusted everyone's understanding around this. I think for frontline employees, it's remained a little bit the same, but there still are some things that they want them to be more proficient in like, you know, uh, digital uh, and technology and tech savviness. Uh, that way they, they can join um, and leverage everything in the remote spaces. But, um, but I think that there's gonna be, that's gonna continue to evolve more and more. And so there's a few ways in, in which I think we should look at it. But the, the main thing is, that we want to look at the applicability of how it helps them in their daily work. And so oftentimes when I think of like going through school, I just wish someone gave me financial literacy. How do I pay my taxes, right? Like, cause that's something that is very applicable. And I think that our, our employees are looking at the same thing. The other thing I want to call out is that there's a lot of fear around automation, how it's going to remove and take away jobs. And so that's, you know, I, I, I don't like how it gets politicized and, and discussed around that. So I'm just going to go with like data around uh, what, what, uh, what's been identified. And the fact is that, yes, some jobs will probably be eliminated or, or something to that effect with automation in that process, whether it's software or machines, whatever. But the whole idea, the thing that we're not seeing and we're not thinking about or talking about is that it's creating more jobs than it, than it, than it takes away. So having a 25 million um, you know, new jobs in that, in that contrast between there is gonna be pretty uh, helpful in that process. So I think what's gonna happen is that we're just redesigning and repurposing what the skills are that are needed for the work that automation is gonna be addressing. And so this is where again, we're, again, we're inching back into what Casey's question is around like what skills. So when this is the case, the way I like to look at it is if I own a vineyard, maybe now I don't have to be the one watering it. And if drones can water the vineyard and I can just get to taste the wine and make sure it works and make sure I'm, I'm you know, fermenting it just right to make sure it's, it tastes great and, and be able to like focus on that versus the, the, you know, the grunt work there, I think that's what we're seeing. So yes, some, some jobs you know, are gonna go away, but I think they're the ones that we are going to provide that much value to us. And now we can think of things that's going to be more impactful and, and discover new things that, that the workforce is going to, be, um, uh, going to be more interested in. So quick note on that as well, too, is that here's a, a quote from the author of the book, Brave New Work. And so uh, I just love a lot of their, what they're sharing. And it's a little more future thinking because they're, they're kind of addressing some of the traditional uh, thought processes and work and, and ways in, in, in providing skills, because they're saying that of skills, even that you learn in the education space, by the time you graduate, this is how fast they're evolving. A lot of that becomes irrelevant by the point that you graduate because automation is coming at such a fast pace that, that, uh, that you really want to focus on the skill sets that are going to provide you a longer shelf life of, of, um, of value. And the organizations as a whole, 
the the whole topic of skills is is so hot right now uh it, it's just overwhelming but it's a it's an urgent need and it's kind of far out there kind of like climate change where we don't need to address it but we don't feel like the sense of urgency because it's out there but we probably should that's kind of what the workforce is seeing around for skills and so uh one of the skills to address is going to be uh what i think the focus should be are soft skills and I don't love that term, not a lot of people do. And so there's often rebranding around that, human skills, effective skills, people skills, whatever you wanna call them. The skills that are not technical skills, the actual transferable human skills are gonna be uh, what we're seeing a ton of organizations are focusing on. And so again, Mr. Adam Grant here has a good, nice, succinct way of, of putting it to identify that they're actually the hardest one to master, even though they're called soft skills. Um, and those people skills of leadership, communication, collaboration, creativity, adaptability, that's a big hot one in my opinion, is that uh, they're becoming more and more vital as things uh, begin to progress. And that's actually the way to combat the automation is being to uh, you know, focus on things like critical thinking skills and the like. Um, and those are gonna become much, much more valuable and they're gonna actually provide a lot more value to, uh, to the individual as well as to the organization uh, because you're gonna be able to provide adaptability. And one uh, thing I'd like to uh, talk and focus on that is um, the way to think about these to circle back to the, the soft skills here. I don't like to even think around it between hard or soft. What I, I still call it the people skills and that should be a, a big focus. But the way I would look at the skills is gonna be more something where um, someone from Guild Education, a great organization, Matthew Daniel wrote a piece where it's uh, he likes to view it as uh, either durable or perishable skills. So what are the ones that you need today to you know, keep the lights on and, and but you plan on evolving over time? And so and getting more into that durable skill set, that's gonna provide you a much longer shelf life. And so I think that's the better way to look at that. So one of the ways that you could address and, and tackle this to make sure that you're providing the relevant skills is mapping it out into um, maybe three buckets. So here's the skills that we know are gonna go away and they're, they have a real limited shelf life. Maybe we should have them there, but we don't put a big investment in it. The next level up should be, um, you know, those that we still need today that are gonna, are gonna um, you know, be a little bit longer. Maybe it's like more like a three to four year time frame that are gonna be needed. So we'll continue to invest a little bit in that, but not make it the priority. And then there's the ones that are gonna be, um, have a lot of longevity in there. Um, the, the ones that will be, you know, seven years plus that we know we're gonna have and it's gonna uh, give us more value if we invest in those now and they'll continue to grow in, in time. And so what I would suggest is thinking of it in three buckets to think around the durable perishable and, and then re reassessing that uh, at the very least annually, but the more frequent you can address and assess those because things are always changing, that's gonna be your way to kind of take a more dynamic approach to your skill assessments and what you need to provide. Because there's, unfortunately, there's so many different industries, so many different roles, it's not really a cookie cutter answer that we can provide for that. But one key one that I think is going to be a massive value is the uh, the, the skill set of being adaptable, having adaptability. And so if, if you're able to uh, invest in that in, in your employees and maybe even source candidates that demonstrate that, I think those are going to be the most valuable because as everything's evolving and changing, those that are um, able to, to pivot and, and quickly shift and, and learn something new, uh, you know, is going to be the case. And so IBM uh, has found that to be the case when they first discovered it in 2016. It was really high up there in 24 or in fourth place in 2016. And then when they reran uh, uh, to compare it of their of their most prevalent skills needed in 2019, that was at the tippy top. And so what they're saying is is that the ability, the value that provides when you have someone that you could just give them something and know that they're going to be able to accomplish it, even if you give them just a little bit of time, and they're going to do it very quickly and and nimbly. Um, and if, if you can do that even in teams, that is gonna be like, that is just money because otherwise you're, it's the, if you don't have that ability to shift and pivot and change, you're gonna be um, running into roadblocks and you're gonna be very reactive instead of proactive. So the sooner you can, can make adjustments and, and get things going, that's gonna be um, very key. So I'm just, uh, uh, one of the other things I'll just even throw on this is that we've even, I've heard others in the market where you have the IQ, you know, your intelligent quotient to try to measure the intelligence of individuals. 
And then EQ is, has become the new thing, emotional intelligence to, to really understand human behavior and, and how to relate to one another. And so now what I've been hearing from others is AQ is a new measurement. Um, don't ask me how, I'm not intelligent enough to, to do that. I'm just smart enough to know that the other smarter people are focusing on things like that of AQ and, and determining what are different individuals and organizations and teams ability to pivot and adapt and change. And uh, because they're, they're finding that to be um, of increasing value in, in their organizations. So one of the last slides here is uh, comes from Mr. Josh Burson, who's, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with him, he's a global industry thought leader. And so he really puts succinctly a lot of what I just kind of uh, was, was talking about in the presentation, which is that of the things that you're looking at for the traditional learning delivery of technologies, um, they're not really built for us to connect as people and to collaborate. So we're looking for solutions that should focus on the learning or experience, that focus on practices, uh, uh, application, collaboration, discussion, and just very easy content creation that can be delivered in the flow of work. And so he just puts it really nicely. So just put that little bow on there with Mr. Burson's quote to kind of wrap it all up here. So with that, I'll uh, check in with you, Sarah, for any questions. Oh, I'm sorry, forgot. Yeah, hashtag give a damn. So that's gonna be the extra little thing that I think to tie into uh, Josh first. Maybe I'll uh, try to get him to throw that into his next quote. Um, but uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sarah, for any questions. Perfect, thanks, Chris. We do have some questions for you. Um, the first one is from Sammy, who wants to know, with all of this training being done on these web conference tools um, now, what's your take on what some have been calling Zoom fatigue? Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, I think we're getting Zoom fatigue primarily from meetings, and I, I, I know it's become more popular, but I, I feel like we've always suffered from meeting fatigue in general. Uh, so I think just the fact that we're always on it, there, there is something very real to it, though, that research has pointed to where if you have your camera on and you're staring at yourself for so long, like you're not meant to do that. It's, it's you know, you don't look yourself in the mirror all day long. So it can be kind of draining if you're fo focusing on yourself and not like on on the content and the discussion. So I think that there's there's times to turn off your camera and there's times to turn it on. And I think you need to be um, cognizant of when those times are. And that's that's something great for you to provide research in your um, you know, human-centered design efforts as you're creating the learner journey to find out when it's, when it's appropriate to turn off, when it's appropriate to turn on. Um, I, I think that the way that I've kind of viewed Zoom fatigue and web conferences, whatever, whatever tool you're, you're using, um, is that it, it's almost kind of like I'm finding lately today, it's more like almost when I'm driving my car, I have the rear view mirror, I can see a portion of myself in that rear view mirror often at times, but like, I don't look at that, I look at the road. And I think we're eventually gonna have a mindset shift where we're gonna focus more on, on the road, uh, which is the training content and the discussion versus kind of ourselves as people. And so um, so that's, that's something I think it's uh, gonna take a while for us to get there. Um, and then for those that can't or still struggle, Go ahead and turn off your, your camera and try to give a good explanation for why you're doing that if, if anyone is resistant because some there's some sticklers out there that think you have to have cameras on um, but uh, i think i think we're going to hopefully get some evolution on that perfect great well, your next question is from gloria who wants to know what are some of the best ways to create a virtual <coughs> sorry about that water cooler experience or kind of that virtual employee experience yeah, the where um, the to being able to kind of have the maybe informal connection, maybe is that kind of am I interpreting that right? Yeah, if you have any tips for kind of creating that like team building bonding experience in a virtual environment. Yeah, yeah, I think um, one thing I, I definitely uh, love to do as much as possible, and what we're hearing from others is that um, talk less, uh, lecture less. Um, it's not always about you, even though you might have the knowledge and mindset uh, 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 and skill set that you wanted to, to deliver. I think if you're finding ways that you can help others learn from each other in a more interactively collaborative way, um, you know, breakout rooms, like, uh, like that's become the, the key thing, I think, a lot. And, and I think there's actually relief in those that are leading and hosting and facilitating a lot for virtual instructor-led 
is to not always have to have the pressure of being the one talking and presenting. You can actually just literally just pose questions and let them like ideate and collaborate together. Um, so I think that's that's one thing. Um, there's often a lot of uh, uh, tools out there that you can have to help them do that, even in a digital sense, um, when it's even more than just conversation. So like Miro, Mural, FigJam, Jamboard, your whiteboard tools, getting something in there where everyone can kind of collaborate with that together. Um, and so they get the visual uh, things where they can do things in unison and see it together is, is great. Um, there's a lot of other uh, kind of fun things, I think, in a collaborative way that you can do things for team building. Um, for instance, I have a, a, a good dear friend of mine who's an industry expert uh, on this space, uh, Cassie Labori. She has a, a consulting company that focuses specific on virtual training. Um, she's got a great book called Interact and Engage. And so in that book, she's even got uh, a 2.01 coming out and she's often is sharing um, virtual escape rooms and how to do those. And so cool team building activities like that, I think are gonna be um, the new wave uh, for, for creating some of those connections in, in the learning space. Very cool, that does sound like fun. <laughs> awesome, well, we have time for maybe one more question here. This one is from Betsipi who wants to know, What's your opinion about instructor-led online training versus self-paced online training? Is there a tendency to promote or use one over the other? Oh, that's a loaded question. Good question. Oh man, you're putting me on the spot. So I'm gonna say these are my opinions, my opinions alone. And, and I, I, I have tremendous respect for the LMSs, the LXPs that are out there. Um, so I think my opinion of, of what's gonna be there, what's not gonna be there, I, I certainly think compliance training is going to be your your asynchronous as uh is the geek speak the the jargon for that um where it's going to be done more self-paced um you know through your traditional scorum e-learning content um so i think those are for certain going to be very obviously heavily used there um as they should i think that what what i would rather say is one better than the other i i you know rather than, than get into that, what I would say more is it's not about either one being better than the other. It's more about what is the blended learner journey that you're providing. And so I would think it's more around that if you look at the journey itself, you're, it, there's always going to be like a, a recipe or a cocktail mix here that you're going to get for that journey to be right. And so I think it's going to be reevaluating re um, in that space to, to space it out more. Um, spatial learning is kind of the key message I would actually throw out there is to think around the spacing in which you provide the synchronous to, and, and the um, asynchronous, you know, the self-paced versus the live. And then, um, and then what is the, the right sweet spot for that? I think that's gonna be more of the area to focus and, and now which one should be where. Again, compliance for the, for the, um, for the thing, but um, the live sessions, I think it's where you're getting people together, collaborate, ideate, and, um, and maybe have coaching and feedback. And, and I think that the, 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 the self-paced is more for practice individually in a safe space for them to try things out um, and do the refreshers, the, the, the knowledge retention questions, little nudges maybe through Slack or Teams or whatever you're using. And so I think there, there's ways to drip that out, um, but the it's just gonna be finding the right balance of, and, and each content is different. Anything that's people skills related, I definitely prefer not to do um, uh, self-paced. I think it's there for just general guideline principles, but the actual practice of it should be live. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks for breaking that down for us. Um, and Chris, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I know I got a lot out of it and I'm sure our audience did as well. Amazing. Well, this is my QR code, but if you got time to go ahead and do that, you can either do that or you can just uh, cyber stalk me on LinkedIn. So thanks, Sarah, for having me. It's been great. And uh, we look forward to anyone interested in class showing you how we solve for some of these problems. But uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. Thank you. Well, at this point, I'd like to invite all of you for some other upcoming training industry webinars this month. You can register for these events and access past webinars now at trainingindustry.com slash webinar. And of course, our webinars and product demos are pre-qualified for one credit hour by SHRM, CPTM, ISPI, and HRCI certifications. CPTM is the leading certification for training managers across the globe. You can find out more about the program now at trainingindustry.com slash CPTM. 
And of course, if you haven't done so already, we do have our training industry conference and expo in person coming up in June in Raleigh, North Carolina. Make sure to check out trainingindustry.com slash TICE to learn more and secure your spot. All right. Well, again, Chris, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Of course, a thank you also goes out to our sponsor for today's event, Class Technologies. And of course, a shout out goes out to all of you for joining us. So for now, I'm Sarah Gallo, and I hope you all have a great day.